Today we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. James Ferrara, the, War the Ward Coleman Chair in Cancer Medicine and Director of the Hematologic Malignancies Translational Research Center. Dr. Ferrara received his MD from Georgetown University, completed his residency in pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital, and his fellowship in hematology oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He was recruited to Mount Sinai from the University of Michigan in 2014, where he created the Mount Sinai Acute GVHD International Consortium, MAGIC, a group of 10 BMT centers throughout the US and Europe to conduct groundbreaking clinical trials in GVHD. Dr. Farrar's research focuses on the immunology of bone marrow transplant, and in particular on its major complications of graft-versus-host disease. His work has led to the identification of novel biomarkers for GVHD. He has published widely and been a recipient of numerous awards. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ferrara. So good morning and happy new year and thank you all for coming um, this morning to uh, hear about an update of what I find to be a very exciting story and it has um, Mount Sinai written all over it. So uh, I'd like to tell you about the progress that we've made in identifying serum proteins that can predict outcomes after hematopoietic cell transplant. Now, not, I assume that not everyone here is uh, a transplanter himself or herself. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, I do have uh, intellectual property. Um, we have a patent on acute GVHD biomarkers. Uh, and I receive royalties from Viracor because this is now a commercially available test. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. So the objectives for this morning, um, uh, if, if I can't achieve these two objectives, then I really will have failed. So by the end of the hour, you should be able to interpret serum magic algorithm probabilities, or maps, um, when they are conducted both before and after treatment for graft-versus-host disease. And you should be able to explain the relationship of the serum map to GVHD pathology, particularly in the gastrointestinal tract, and why a map uh, can be considered a liquid biopsy. Okay, so hematopoietic cell transplant. It's one of the most successful immunotherapies that men and, men and women have devised for hematologic malignancies. This is the number of transplants that are performed. Um, uh, these are data from the Center for International Bone Marrow Transplant Research. And you can see that um, <clears throat> in the late Middle Ages, when I was a house officer uh, in the 1980s, uh, there were very few transplants done. The green is allogeneic transplant, which simply means a donor that is not uh, an identical twin. Uh, and then an autologous transplant, um, which are stem cells from yourself. Um, and you, well, I'll show you in just a moment uh, the diseases for which we use these transplants. But you can see that, uh, for example, between, 2000, between the year 2000 and 2010, there was um, about a 60% increase in transplants, and about every 15 years, the number of transplants uh, in the US doubles. Um, the age of the transplant recipient is, in fact, very important. Uh, when I trained as a pediatrician, all of the transplants performed were done for aplastic anemia in patients under the age of 35. So it was essentially a pediatric uh, uh, intervention. And then as uh, we knew from work that had been done by the Nobel laureate uh, Don Thomas, that the graft versus leukemia effect was very important in terms of eliminating malignancies. Now most patients with hematologic malignancies <clears throat> are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so over the past uh, 20 years, let's say, you can see that the, as the number of transplants increased, the number of patients who were uh, in their 60s and now even in their 70s, those are the groups in which the transplants have uh, increased uh, uh, relatively in the largest proportions. There are significant challenges in delivering high-dose chemotherapy, uh, radiation chemotherapy, and an allogeneic transplant to uh, patients in their 60s and 70s. Uh, and a graft-versus-host disease is among the most serious of those complications. 
So the work that we're doing here is really very much related to making transplants safer and more effective for our older patients. <clears throat> here are the indications for transplant in the U.S. This is from um, 15, uh, almost 15,000 patients, uh, and this is the year 2016. What you can see is that <clears throat> the diagnosis of multiple myeloma uh, overwhelmingly receives an autologous transplant, so it's really a way, an autologous transplant is really a way of delivering high-dose chemotherapy to a patient. In this case, uh, it's usually melphalan. For uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's only about 20% of the patients receive allotransplants. But then for the acute leukemias, both acute uh, myelogenous leukemia and acute lymphocytic leukemia, uh, all of the transplants are allogeneic because it is absolutely required to have a graft versus leukemia effect to be successful. So the majority of the um, <clears throat> Uh, allogeneic transplants are, in fact, performed for either uh, high-risk lymphomas or acute leukemias or pre-leukemic conditions such as myelodysplastic syndrome. So just, just very briefly, um, in the donor graft, there are hematopoietic stem cells and there are also lymphocytes, and the, and the lymphocytes that are most important in terms of the immediate um, uh, both benefit and toxicities are T cells. So in a patient who has, let's say, um, acute myelogenous leukemia that with uh, 6 percent uh, circulating blasts, it's estimated that that patient has approximately 1 trillion malignant cells, 1 trillion. So if you give high-dose chemoradiotherapy, and you get a 99.9% kill, you're still left with 0.1% or 1 billion, 1 billion malignant cells after the chemotherapy. Um, and if a patient is in remission, that may go down an order of magnitude, but that's still 100 million malignant cells that you have to eradicate in order to achieve a, a durable, complete remission. So the graft versus leukemia effect that is mediated by the T cells is absolutely critical to the success of an allogeneic transplant. However, the Protein antigens that are recognized on the malignant cells by the T cells, they're, they're often minor histocompatibility antigens, and those same minor histocompatibility antigens are not only on the malignant cells, they are also on normal cells, uh, particularly epithelial cells, and so you wind up often with a problem of, uh, in the skin, the liver, and the GI tract, those are the standard target organs for GVHD. In animal models, it is also very clear that uh, the lung is a target organ, but for various reasons, it's not considered part of the usual GVHD grading. Um, almost um, half of patients uh, get some form of graft-versus-host disease, and it is often lethal, particularly when it comes in the GI tract. So here is an example of survival after allogeneic transplant for acute myelogenous leukemia. And what you can see is that we have, at five years, we have about a 50 percent survival rate for patients who have early or intermediate, uh, intermediate disease, and that's often a combination of the, of the remission status as well as molecular markers like FLT3. And then if you have advanced disease, either because <clears throat> the patient is in relapse, florid relapse at the time of transplant or because they have very high risk markers, uh, we only have about a 20 percent uh, survival. Now early on in the first year, the, the, that is when acute graft versus host disease causes the most uh, mortality and it's approximately, when we say 50 percent of our patients survive, um, it's, it's about 50-50 relapse versus a death from complications, non-relapse mortality. And graft-versus-host disease is the major cause of non-relapse mortality. So acute GVHD usually occurs within the first six months after transplant. It can be rapidly progressive. It often starts uh, as a skin rash, and which may be grade one, but then can proceed up to grade four. Uh, 
The skin, the liver, and the GI tract are the main targets, but it's most often lethal when the, the GVHD is severe and in the GI tract. Uh, and it is clearly mediated by T cells. Now, up until, uh, up until actually I came to Mount Sinai, I used to tell medical students that measles was a GVHD-like rash because they were much more likely to see GVHD than they were likely to see measles. Unfortunately, that is no longer the case. Um, but as you can see here, that it is a, 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 a maculopapular rash. You can often see it on the palms and soles. It can uh, spread over the entire uh, body. In this case, this is uh, more than 50% of this patient's skin is covered in this rash, and that's a stage three, but an overall grade two. Uh, and then you can often bleed into these um, uh, 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 rashes, and uh, it can be quite severe, eventually uh, um, <coughs> uh, causing a total body erythroderm if it is the most severe and grade four. But it is gastrointestinal GVHD that is the biggest problem. It's the principal cause of non-relapse mortality, or NRM. The blood biomarker ST2 which was identified in my laboratory about 10 years ago, is a soluble IL-33 receptor. And that is an important uh, GVHD biomarker, and you'll hear more about that in a moment. Now, <clears throat> the cellular biomarker that is critical here is the PANETH cell. And the PANETH cell is in the crypt of the small intestine. Um, we're going to talk about more about that in a moment, but it it's known to regulate the GI microbiome by secreting a number of important antimicrobial peptides, including defensins and regenerative 3-alpha, or Reg3. Um, the number of PANETH cells actually inversely correlates with the severity of graft-versus-host disease, both experimentally and in the clinic. Um, and uh, even I can identify a PANETH cell on light microscopy because there are these huge uh, eosinophilic granules that you can uh, very uh, clearly identify and you can count them. Now, in the past five years, we've made a lot of progress in uh, perfecting the magic algorithm probability or MAP. So, I came to Mount Sinai about five and a half years ago specifically to uh, direct and uh, essentially found an international consortium that would study the problem of graft-versus-host disease. Because in the past 40 years, despite all of the immunology that we've learned, um, both related to cancer and, and related to normal physiology, there has not been, until last year, there has not been a single drug that was approved for graft-versus-host disease. And even now, we only have one drug that's approved for steroid-resistant graft-versus-host disease on the basis of one phase two study in 49 patients. So it's been extremely difficult to study in a multicenter setting. So we came here to actually found this consortium. Um, there are now 24 international centers uh, who provide both clinical data and longitudinal serum samples. And we now have about 4,000 patients and about 100,000 serum samples uh, in um, freezer banks here at Mount Sinai. It turns out that the serum levels of ST2 and Reg3 alpha reflect the CRIP destruction that's responsible for the vast majority of NRM. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you some data about that in a moment. We can use the concentrations of, uh, in the magic algorithm probability, or MAP, uh, to estimate the probability of non-relapse mortality at six months for each and every individual patient. Uh, it's this rather um, uh, formidable um, logarithmic equation that you see at the bottom there, um, but we have now used it in thousands of patients and shown it to be uh, really quite reproducible. Uh, <clears throat> here is an example. These are, uh, this is a study that we published now uh, almost five years ago, just when we were starting out. Um, and this is for each patient when we take a serum sample. And we, and we look at the concentrations of these two biomarkers, we combine them by that algorithm, and we get a single probability of non-relapse mortality. This work had, had initially been done uh, in, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, so we called them Ann Arbor scores. 
uh, and low risk was Ann Arbor 1, and intermediate risk was Ann Arbor 2, and high risk was Ann Arbor 3. Uh, and so you can see the, the, the actual um, ranges here for each of these risk scores. And you can see the non-relapse mortality here, and this was, this was in about uh, 200 patients, and then you can see the overall survival. So these are highly, th this um, serum uh, probability is generated at the onset of disease when, when someone might only have, for example, a grade one rash, which does not predict how the disease is going to predict, uh, uh, to uh, progress. Uh, you can't tell that from the initial manifestations of the disease. Uh, so this serum um, uh, probability can tell you that, uh, and, and you can see the, the result in terms of the overall responses to therapy and, and overall survival. Now, the initial algorithm actually had three biomarkers. And when they changed, uh, we did not develop our own antibodies. Uh, we measured these biomarkers by ELISA. We did not develop the antibodies. We used commercial kits. And when the commercial kit for ST2 changed, the capture antibody changed, it became more sensitive, but in a nonlinear fashion. So we had to re-derive the algorithm. And when we re-derived it, um, it turned out that the uh, TNF receptor type 1 was no longer needed. So we got all of the information that was required for an accurate probability from both REG3 and SG2, and we published this uh, three years ago. So just to show you now in a, in a validation set how this works, these are now magic patients from uh, across the globe. Uh, these are 252 patients whose onset clinical grade of GVHD is grade two. So, um, when, so that's, the, that's either maybe a little bit of diarrhea, it's less than a half a liter, or a skin rash that is greater than 50% of the body surface. And you can see here that, uh, again, we have, have these three uh, Ann Arbor groups with highly uh, statistically different curves for each of their uh, non-relapse probabilities. This, as you would imagine, will correlates very well with the um, response to steroid treatment, which is the current standard therapy for as primary treatment for GVHD. And there are differences between Ann Arbor 1, Ann Arbor 2, Ann Arbor 3. And what's most interesting to us is that, in fact, the majority of patients, when they present with graft-versus-host disease needing treatment, needing the, it's two milligrams per kilogram of steroids, and that often um, <coughs> uh, extends over several months, the, uh, the majority of patients, uh, over 60 percent, are now actually at low risk. Uh, about a quarter of the patients are intermediate risk, and 15 of the patients are at high risk. So we really can now start to use these biomarkers as risk stratification tools for the initial treatment of graft-versus-host disease. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about the biology here, because it's really um, uh, important in our uh, evolving understanding of how both immunosuppressant therapies uh, work and don't work. So in the GI crypt, there are intestinal stem cells. This is um, work initially uh, done by Hans Klevers, uh, now over a decade ago. And we know that the LGR5 positive cells can generate all the cell lineages in the crypt and the villus. But these stem cells, uh, shown here, often live next to panic cells that are sometimes called the stem cell bodyguards. Um, they provide growth signals, such as WIN3, and <clears throat> are also important for the chemical physical barrier um, that's represented here by the mucus as they secrete these uh, peptides and proteins into the mucus and it forms a shield over the lumen of the enterocytes um, and the one trillion um, bugs in the microbiome that are waiting just on the other side. Now, regenerative 3 alpha, it's alpha in human, and the mouse homologue is gamma, so it's regenerative 3 gamma. And you will sometimes see in the mouse experiments, I'm using the reg 3 gamma um, uh, icon. Uh, it's, it's known to be an antimicrobial C-type lectin, but it is also a very powerful biomarker of GI-GVHD, and reg 3 alpha is stimulated 
by interleukin-22 secretion that comes from these innate lymphoid cells that are in crypto patches just beneath um, the, the crypts, uh, just below the stem cells and the panis cells here. Uh, and IL-22 uh, plays an important part in this story. So we can, can I'll, I'm going to show you the data as to why we think this, but we consider the map a liquid biopsy because during GVHD, ST2 and Reg3 are um, secreted into the bloodstream, and particularly Reg3 is dumped into the capillaries when a panet cell is destroyed. Um, and you get both the panet cell contents and the contents from the mucus actually leaking into the capillaries and um, uh, uh, now uh, circulating through the systemic um, uh, system. And this already starts to illuminate new relationships between the innate immune system that is already present in the epithelia as well as the uh, lymphocytes that are causing the graft versus host disease. So in the next several slides, I'll show you some data from our mouse models. So this happens to be a, a, a black mouse recipient of, a, a, from, of bone marrow and lymphocytes from a brown mouse, and they are completely different except that they, say they, they share the same matched, uh, major histocompatibility complex. So this is like an unrelated donor transplant. Uh, you can see the serum level of Reg3 that rises in black as the GVHD occurs uh, two weeks after the transplant. But the surprise was when we went to look for the, by immunohistochemistry, when we went to look in the gut to see which cells were actually producing the Reg3, what we found was that when there was no graft versus host disease, there was, uh, in the brown staining, you can see uh, regenerative 3 gamma. Uh, you can see that, the, that there are, uh, they're staining all throughout <coughs> the villus and, and, and in all parts of the intestine. Was, whereas when there was graft versus host disease, there was actually very little staining. So this was a paradox. Where was this Reg3 coming from? Because it was clearly elevated in the bloodstream, but there's actually less of it being made in the intestine. So first we went to look to see whether this was also the same in humans. Um, I'm showing you aggregated data from the mouse here on the bottom where the serum levels go up, whereas the, uh, here, this is mRNA expression, it actually goes down uh, in the intestine. And we had about 30 samples from patients who had been biopsied. Uh, these were data from the University of Michigan. Uh, and the, uh, you can see again that the Reg3 um, levels go up in the patients with graft versus host disease but actually the protein expression by quantitative immunohistochemistry goes down in the intestine. So um, our mouse model is now uh, reflective of the human uh, condition. And what we could see was this is a clinical GVHD score which gets uh, increased as we increase the number of T cells in the donor inoculum uh, so that we get, uh, this is severe GVHD. Um, uh, and you can also see the serum reg 3 increasing. But please notice here that when the clinical score, these are mice, but when the clinical score increases just a little bit, the amount of reg 3 goes up in the serum over a hundred fold. So this, this the, was the first um, clue that it was something that was already being, not being produced, but that was already, had already been produced and was being um, just released into the systemic circulation. And then you can see here on the right that the amount of Reg3 actually being made decreases as the serum level increases and as the GVHD gets worse. Now we, look, we looked exhaustively for uh, other places that might be, that were known to make uh, regenerative 3, uh, including the pancreas, the thymus, the lung, the skin, and the liver. We could not find it anywhere during graft versus host disease. So this clinched the idea that it was being, uh, the uh, pre-stored uh, protein was being released. And IL-22 that's produced in the crypto patches that I told you about um, was also dramatically decreased during graft versus host disease. And since you need IL-22 secretion to get Reg3 production, we said, well, suppose you just give now pharmacologic doses of IL-22, can you restore Reg3 and possibly reverse the graft versus host disease? So here are um, 
uh, 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 histomicrographs of uh, the villus, and this is now immunohistochemistry of the, of the ileum in, uh, with uh, no graft versus host disease. You can see the villus blunting here, uh, which is characteristic of, of GVHD, uh, and you can see that there is less um, Reg3 staining, but when you add IL-22, this was every other day for about the first week, uh, we now reverse uh, the uh, um, histologic characteristics, and you can see that there is now Reg3 not only in the crypt, but all throughout the villus. So enterocytes retain this ability, um, as we saw in the animals without graft-versus-host disease. They, they retain this ability when under stress, as long as there is not inflammation, of producing large amounts of Reg3 that helps in wound healing. When we looked now to see whether there was, we could reverse this, this paradox of up in the serum and down in the, in the intestine uh, by IL-22, we found that we could. Here's uh, serum Reg3 being decreased after IL-22 treatment, whereas the Reg3 is actually being increased in the intestine. And in fact, the IL-22, as we and others have uh, shown before us, can rescue these mice from uh, GVHD, which is driven by GI pathology. Is, so there's an association, but is it required? So there are mice that are um, knockouts for Reg3, which are completely normal at rest, and they grow and they uh, can reproduce. Um, and here are the, the wild types and the darker colors <coughs> that are uh, rescued by uh, IL-22 secretion uh, going from the orange to the blue, but when the, when the recipients lack Reg3, IL-22, the GVHD is worse, um, and IL-22 cannot rescue it. And this is not an artifact of <clears throat> a strain combination, because if we do it in a second strain combination, we see exactly the same thing. You must have a regenerative 3 um, a being able to be produced in the intestine in order to, um, for the uh, crypts to restore themselves and for the GI tract to heal. Now, <clears throat> the initial hypothesis was because Reg3 was known to be an antimicrobial peptide that's actually specific for gram-positive cocci, we thought that this was altering the microbiome in some way. And there are definitely studies that show that the microbiome is disrupted during graft-versus-host disease. But when we looked in these very experiments, the microbiome didn't change between those animals that did not have Reg3 versus those that did. So it wasn't a Reg3 phenomenon that was, that was uh, driving the increase. So we then went to look to see, well, what, what exactly was going on? And we knew that the intestinal stem cells were critical targets in the GI tract. So here are, are these are more mouse experiments. Um, this is now the number, the percent of intestinal stem cells when there is no graft-versus-host disease, and whether or not the animal uh, gets IL-22, it doesn't matter, and whether or not it has Reg3, it doesn't matter. As long as there's no inflammation, the, the, the crypt can regenerate and the, and the intestine can heal. When there's graft versus, the inflammation of graft-versus-host disease, the number of stem cells drops by about 70%. And if you give IL-22, it uh, significantly reverses that. But if the animals don't have Reg3, under the inflammatory conditions of GVHD, the stem cells drop to 90, only 10% of their, their value, and IL-22 can't touch it. So the intestinal stem cells were definitely requiring Reg3 to regenerate under the inflammatory conditions of GVHD. And then when we looked at how they were dying, because apoptosis is, is a, <clears throat> an important um, pathologic marker of GVHD, we could see indeed there was increased apoptosis under, under wild-type conditions that was reversed by IL-22, um, but when the mice lacked Reg3 under GVHD conditions, their apoptosis now increased six to eight-fold. Mm -hmm. So that suggested that there might be a separate function for Reg3 independent of its antimicrobial properties. So we then have started now some in vitro tests and we looked first at epithelial cell lines and found that 
Uh, in fact, the stress that's in, that can be induced with a SMAC mimetic and TNF-alpha can be uh, reduced when Reg3 is added. And when we look at the viability and, and just now increase the uh, dose of Reg3 that's added to culture where there's no microbiome at all, right, these are sterile conditions, we can see that the stress that was initially caused can be absolutely alleviated by adding Reg3. And then when we look back in vivo at the amount of Reg3 that's being made and relate that to the number of stem cells that we can see in the CRIPS, there is an absolute correlation uh, which is highly significant. So we've now discovered a completely new function for this peptide made by pan cells that was known to be to have antimicrobial functions, but now it has pro-survival and anti-apoptotic functions for stem cells, which opens up now a whole new way of thinking about um, crypt diseases, not only in graft-versus-host disease, but in, in other um, diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease. But that would be another talk. All right. <clears throat> Back now to our patients. We can show that the biomarkers, the MAP, will predict overall survival. And very importantly, there's no association with relapse. I started this by telling you that the graft versus leukemia effect is critical to the success of an allotransplant. And when you reduce graft versus host disease by other means, for example, by high dose steroids, sometimes you see a, 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 an increase in relapse because there's a diminution of the graft versus leukemia effect. So the first question was, if we can predict the severity of graft versus host disease by these biomarkers, is that also related to relapse? Are we just looking at the strength of the graft versus host reaction? So here is a paper that we published last year, actually with the Mount Sinai student as the, as the first author, because she had done uh, a, a, a year's work with us in the laboratory. What you can see when we divide our patients into high risk and low risk patients just by um, the, uh, just by the map, uh, you can see that high-risk patients have a great increase in non-relapse mortality, mostly driven by GI, GVHD, and the relapse is exactly the same. There is no difference at all, uh, and so you see this large difference in overall survival. And that's, that's just now to remind us that what we're really measuring here with these biomarkers is the damage to the GI crypt. It's not the strength, the number of allogeneic T cells that are responding to histocompatibility antigens. It's how much damage has been done to the, to the stem cells and the panic cells in the crypt. Okay. What's interesting about these, the MAP, these biomarkers, is that they are both more specific and more sensitive for lower GI damage than the classical symptoms of GI GVHD. So the lower GI symptoms are um, essentially measured in the volume of diarrhea. And this is what we've been doing for 40 years. It's really sort of stone age medicine. It's a terrible measure. Uh, the only problem is it's like democracy. It's the worst form of government except for all the rest because we had nothing else. Uh, and, and it's a real problem, for example, for our um, female patients, because you come in in the morning and it's, you know, you've got two liters um, uh, uh, mix plus, 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 plus. Well, well, how much diarrhea was that? Was that 500 cc's? Was that a liter? Was it? So, so we don't know. So we're constantly guessing. When we looked at the biomarkers, and we looked in both uh, in patients where there were GI symptoms that were present, so they had diarrhea, uh, as in this case, we, su we see that there's a, about a 40% difference in those patients who are low risk or high risk by biomarkers when, the, when the, um, uh, the diarrhea is present. So it's both more specific and it's more sensitive. We can find about a quarter of the patients who actually have high-risk biomarkers even though they don't have diarrhea. So the diarrhea isn't actually reflecting the amount of crit damage. It's, it's all the other pathophysiology that's kind of downstream from that. So we, so we now have these biomarkers that are both more sensitive and more specific. In fact, the MAP can predict non-relapse mortality in all patients, including those with clinical responses 
to their GVHD treatment. So this is a validation set of about 267 patients. They've got this uh, non-relapse mortality at uh, one year is about 15%. And now when you uh, use the biomarkers, you can see that 10% of these patients, even though they've had a clinical response to their GVHD treatment, still remain at high risk. Uh, and have almost a 40% non-relapse mortality compared to the 90% of patients, which is initially what you thought was everyone, um, who are low risk. Even more interesting are the patients that don't respond to therapy. This is usually considered one week after transplant. Um, here it's about a 40% non-relapse mortality at a year. And in these 100 patients, almost, uh, actually more than half, 57%, were actually low risk by biomarkers, and they only had a non-relapse mortality of 20% compared to the other half, which had a, an NRM of 60%. So we can use these biomarkers regardless of the clinical phenotype in front of us in terms of whether the patient, the severity of GVHD or whether they've responded to therapy. We now looked at whether the map could be, uh, could more accurately predict NRM at various time points and whether it could be considered a response biomarker. So here you have the receiver operating characteristic curve, the areas under those curves, that's a, it's a C statistics, it's often used as, the, as the, a, a, an important measure of the accuracy of any test, including a clinical test. And, um, Something that's greater than 80 is considered to be very good. When we, when we look at clinical response alone, be it after, it starts at, a, at an AUC of 0.59 after one week, and it goes up to 0.7 after four weeks. That four weeks, uh, whether you've responded to treatment after, uh, after four weeks of treatment, is the gold standard for all of the GVHD clinical trials. And its AUC is only 0.7. It's okay, but it's not terrific. When we look at the biomarkers, it's the AUC starts above 80 and winds up at 0.86 at four weeks. So at every single time point, the biomarkers are giving us more information than the clinical phenotype in front of us. In fact, biomarkers after one week of therapy give us significantly better and more accurate information <laughs> than the clinical response after four weeks of therapy. So what we're always looking for is actionable information as soon as we can get it, and this is very likely to change the way we now manage our patients because it is so much more accurate even after one week of therapy. We also look to see whether we could combine the clinical phenotype together with the biomarkers. So we, we took a, a, a new, um, training set, we, we let the uh, uh, biomarkers fall where they may, and we tried to make up a new algorithm. But when we put them together, the biomarkers and the clinical responses, we could not get a uh, test that gave us better information than just the biomarkers alone. So if you had one piece of information, if, you, if you've got in front of you uh, in clinic, someone with a new rash or new diarrhea, you think it's graft versus host disease. If you have one piece of information that you want to get, it's not how, what the severity of the GVHD is at that moment, it's what's, what, what are the serum biomarkers and what's the crypt destruction that's going on um, in the GI tract. Um, uh, now we are going to look to see whether we can evaluate whether a change in biomarkers actually will also can be used as a measure of how well the therapy is working. So we uh, now looked at wherever the biomarkers started at week zero, and then we intervened with whatever the systemic therapy was. For 90% of these patients, it was steroids. And then we looked after four weeks and saw where the maps were. Here are the patients at lowest risk. So they start with the lowest, um, uh, uh, maps, and you can see that in and, and blue is the patients who survived, uh, and in the Mount Sinai red are the patients who died. And you can see that all of the deaths are clustered at the, in the patients um, who have the greatest increases in their map. And when we aggregate this, we can see that it's a statistically significant difference. 
in the Ann Arbor II patients, remember, those are in the middle. Um, now, now you see that there's even more of a sort of a separation here with most of those surviving here and then those that were dying over there. That's a, a very statistically significant difference. And even with the, the highest, um, the patients who start with the most crypt destruction, those who survive are the ones that have the greatest decrease in their maps. And so you can see that that's also a statistically significant difference. This result suggested that we could try to aim our therapy to get below a single threshold. And when we looked, when, the, when actually we did computer learning and um, uh, machine algorithms to decide, is there a single threshold that actually uh, divides patients most effectively into low risk and high risk, uh, it did come up with an answer. And it, was, it happened to be the same threshold that we had previously determined was the risk between Ann Arbor 3 and Ann Arbor 2. It's a, it's a 0 .290. Uh, this is work, again, done by a medical student that was published uh, two years ago. And what we found was for the Ann Arbor 1 patients who are at lowest risk to start, 5% of them actually go above this threshold during their treatment for GVHD. It's only 5%, but if you go above that threshold, you now have a 50% overall survival compared to about an 80%. Using that same threshold, uh, we saw the same pattern for Ann Arbor 2 patients that start at intermediate risk, but now there uh, is 27% of the patients rise above that threshold as opposed to 5 and for the Ann Arbor 3 patients who start above that threshold, they have to come below it. Only a third of the patients come below it, but they also have a highly statistically improved outcome compared to those who stay above the threshold. So we can now really start to use these thresholds as a guidepost in our um, treatment of graft-versus-host disease and being able to give patients much more information about how they're doing and not only whether their rash is resolving or whether their diarrhea has gone away. So let's finish with a couple of examples of how we would use these biomarkers in the clinic. So our first case, this is a 33-year-old female. She's got FLT3 positive AML that's in second remission. She receives a, a transplant from an unrelated volunteer donor. She receives high-dose conditioning with fludarabine and bucelfan. She receives tacrolimus and methotrexate for her GVHD prophylaxis. Her initial transplant course is unremarkable. Uh, she engrafts on day 13, so that's when the white blood cells return into the, you can see them now in the um, a peripheral blood, uh, and she's discharged four days later. So she has no complications initially from transplant. She, her first clinic visit is fine, but when she comes back for her second clinic visit 12 days later, she now has an itchy rash that's 80% of her body surface. That's a stage three uh, skin. She's had two episodes of diarrhea. I mean, at least when patients come to me in clinic and, I, and they've said how much um, you know, how are your bowel movements? So oh, I've had diarrhea. How much diarrhea have you had? They never say 350 cc's or, or 700 cc's. You know, I was on the toilet all day. Is, is, is said, well, how many times? At the, at the University of Michigan, we actually, while patients were in the hospital, we quantitated how large an, an average episode of diarrhea is for these patients, and it's about 200 cc's. So if she's had two episodes of diarrhea, that's 400 cc's, that's less than a half a liter, that's still GI, GVHD, grade zero. So, and her bilirubin is 1.7, the, 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 the first tick is at 2.0, so she's got an overall grade two GVHD. This would normally have us start systemic steroids, and we might. We send the biomarker results. She's got a moderately elevated ST2, actually at about 50,000, but her reg 3 is at baseline. It's, it's at the lower limit of detection. So her overall map is only 0 0.12, 0 0.119. She's in Ann Arbor 1. So she has a, uh, she's very likely to respond to steroids only. She may not even need steroids. So here at Mount Sinai, this patient would actually um, be eligible for a clinical trial in which we are trying to avoid steroids completely, uh, 
Uh, and so it's a phase two clinical trial of a JAK1 inhibitor, it's a sitinib. And if we didn't have a clinical trial, and I was caring for this patient, I would say, okay, you have low risk biomarkers. We want to see if we can give you as little steroid as possible. So instead of starting at two per kilo, we'd start at one per kilo or even less, maybe at 0.5 per kilo and try to do a rapid taper. We'll come back to our patient. It's the same patient. It's the same phenotype. And now we send the biomarkers and we get actually the same SC2 result, but now her Reg3 is almost 100-fold higher. And her MAP is now 0.317. She's at high risk. She is, has a 40% non-relapse mortality at a year, and she's not likely to respond to steroids. So she needs more aggressive immunosuppression as early as we can get it. And here, there is a phase two, and in fact, throughout MAGIC, there is a phase two clinical trial of an anti-alpha-4 monoclonal antibody, natalizumab, plus steroids as primary treatment. Okay, same patient um, who is now high risk. Um, she gets treated on the natalizumab trial, and she comes back uh, eight days later. Um, her rash, it's maybe a little better, but not much actually. She's still got about 65, 70 percent of her, of, her, of her body surfaces covered with this rash. She now has one loose stool, whereas before she had two, but she's still a GI zero, and her bilirubin hasn't changed. It's 1.8. Technically speaking, this is grade two acute GVHD, and technically speaking, this is no response, because that's exactly what she had a week ago by our current grading system. So we send the biomarkers, and now what we find is that her SC2 hasn't moved very much, but her Reg3 has decreased by 70%. So now her MAP is 0.229. She's actually low risk after treatment. When we look at all of these patients, um, they only have about a 15% um, non-relapse mortality at 12 months uh, with, a, with an 80% overall survival rate. So for her, even though she, quote, is a non-responder, she actually is a responder by the biomarkers, and we know that we can look at the biomarkers as a response. And so the recommendation would be to continue her on the clinical trial of natalizumab and steroids. So to conclude, the MAP is, uses the serum concentrations of SC2 and Reg3, and it provides a liquid biopsy of GVHD damage to the GI crypts that can predict long-term outcomes. Reg3 is a panacell protein with unexpected pro-survival properties that directly protect intestinal stem cells from GVHG damage. The MAP, after one, two, and four weeks of treatment, it's a better surrogate for a endpoint, a surrogate endpoint for six-month NRM than clinical responses. And after one week, the MAP is more accurate than the clinical responses after four weeks. The changes in biomarker probability predict non-relapse mortality and can guide therapy and movement to above or below the threshold can, uh, correlates with five-fold changes in NRM. I want to highlight that all of the work of the MAP as a response biomarker was done by a sensational um, portal student uh, who's here at Mount Sinai. He's the class of 2020. Um, uh, he spent one year with us uh, looking at these biomarkers and correlating them with clinical outcomes. Um, in 2019, he received not one, not two, but three research awards, including, uh, including at the Acute Leukemia Forum, a translational science meeting in Washington, D.C., and at the American Society of Hematology a month ago, he received the Outstanding Abstract Achievement Award for the best abstract by a medical student. He's also a first author manuscript in uh, Blood Advances that was just published last month. So let me acknowledge the other people who did uh, this uh, wonderful work. Uh, Dong Cheng Zhao and Sam Zhang are in the laboratory working on the animal studies. The Magic Data Coordinating Center and Biorepository is led by my uh, terrific colleague, John Levine. Umut Ozbek is our uh, biostatistician, and here are the Magic Centers. And none of this would have been possible of course, without the NIH support from the PO1, but particularly the support from the Tisch Cancer Institute and the ability to set up magic here in New York. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd be delighted to answer any questions.
stool itself for these biomarkers as opposed to the blood? Okay, I'll repeat the question for people who are listening elsewhere. Have we looked in the stool itself? Um, we have not. Um, when we tried doing some of these um, studies in the animal experiments where it's a little more uh, controlled, uh, they were quite variable. And we don't know whether that's because they're degraded. Um, you would imagine that you would be able to see some, but it, it, just, it just wasn't as, um, as quantitative. But you, you would expect that you might see some, of the, uh, some changes in the stool. The, the reg three, just to, to clarify, is it a cleavage product? Um, and it, so it, what's the enzyme that cleaves it? Um, it is made in a pro form, but I don't think it's actually a cleavage product. I'd, I'd have to go back and, and look at that. It's a relatively heavy protein. It's about 147 kilodaltons. So, so if, the, if it's cleaved, it's not, not much is cut off. There is a movement to use bone marrow transplant as a treatment for the most severe cases of Crohn's disease. And my question would be, would this be a valid or an invalid marker for treatment of a disease that is itself destroying intestinal tissue? So that's a wonderful question. Um, uh, it's got actually several parts. Um, for, first of all, I think that it's an autologous transplant um, that we use for the most severe cases. Um, there actually is a clinical trial going on here right now. We have worked with the uh, inflammatory bowel disease group looking at these biomarkers, and it turns out that the, um, when we looked at SC2, Reg3, and CRP, which is known to be a biomarker currently, the best combination was CRP and Reg3. And it increased significantly, and the, and the area under the curve uh, for mucosal healing in IBD increased significantly. It's almost 0.9. So we're just waiting for a valid, that's, that was in the training set, we're just waiting for a validation set, but we think that this could actually be very useful for IBD patients, and particularly ones uh, with Crohn's disease. And, and PANA cells are uh, most abundant in the terminal ileum, and so, and, and so we're really thinking, when you think of liquid biopsy, that's probably the area that we're getting the, the best information about. But it, it could be very useful in Crohn's disease, I think. There was another question. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, your, your mouse studies had some really interesting mechanistic implications. Yeah. Um, so what are the prospects for therapy based on IL-22 or Reg3? Yeah, so, so th there actually is a small clinical trial already going on about IL-22. Um, uh, IL uh, it turns out that getting Reg3 into the, where you want it is maybe difficult. So we ha have experimented actually with you know, could you uh, put it into a, a bacterium that, that produces it? But, but, but that's a whole other non-immunosuppressive way of looking at uh, therapy for graft-versus-host disease and particularly focused on the gut. So that there are um, studies going on. There. One last question. So another uh, issue that you really sort of raised was the microbiome. <clears throat> and there have been some studies uh, correlating changes in the microbiome with graft-versus-host disease. I'm wondering if you look at the microbiome to see which organisms or what kind of changes in organisms occur and correlate that with the biomarkers. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. We actually have done some work on that because, um, and others have, uh, particularly Sloan Kettering, have done lots of work on that. We could, in terms of Reg3, we could not actually see a difference in terms of the microbiome. Now, that doesn't mean that the microbiome isn't important. But when um, uh, people have looked at this, it seems that enterococcus is one of the worst offenders. And certainly, the correlation between increases in enterococcus uh, and the severity of GVHD, that seems to be holding up. And there was just... Um, Several weeks ago, a patient in science, uh, a paper in Science Translational Medicine about enterococcus and the microbiome and GVHD, which I would um, uh, refer you to because it's it's really very interesting. It's complicated, but it's interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much.